This video will be about closures. And rather than start with a definition, I'm going to start with an example. In the Python code on the left, we have the function fibgen that defines two local variables. A nested subprogram fib is defined inside of fibgen, and it has non-local access to n1 and n2. So when n1 or n2 are referenced inside of fib, the variable being modified is the one inside of fibgen. Fib also defines a new variable n that is local. However, this only happens in the else case. Now, Python has many features of functional programming. Specifically, it treats functions as first-order types. And so the next thing that the fibgen function does is it returns the fib function that was defined inside of it. Notice that in the code below this, we then assign the function returned by calling fibgen to a variable. This variable fibfunc contains a function, and therefore inside the loop, we can call it like a function. Now usually, when we call a function like fibgen, all of the activation records, and therefore all reference to local variables, is eliminated from the stack as these functions return. However, we have a reference to a function that was defined inside of fibgen. So what happens when we call it? Well, let's look at the execution. As probably could have been guessed by the name, repeatedly calling fibfunc prints out a sequence of Fibonacci numbers, the sequence defined by adding the two previous numbers in the sequence over and over. However, we didn't actually send any parameters to this function. It simply updated some internal variables. But where did these exist? Let's walk through the first few steps of executing this to get a sense for where these variables existed. This is a good point to say that what we've defined here is a closure. A closure is a function that maintains state between executions or calls. Now remember that when we call fibfunc, we're actually calling the nested subprogram fib that was defined inside of fibgen. n1 and n2 are both zero initially, so the very first time that fib is called, the local variable n actually isn't defined because we end up in the first case of this if-else statement. It is indeed true that n1 and n2 are both zero. Note, however, that we modify the value of n1 inside that case. n1 is set to 1 before a value is returned, namely 1. Now, every time fibfunc is called, an instance of the fib subprogram is on the call stack, and it goes away whenever that function returns. But the values of n1 and n2 persist in memory so that the next time we call fibfunc, which of course is calling fib, we refer to the previously instantiated values. So now the first case of that if-else is not true. We instead go to the else case inside of fib, and we'll define a local variable n that equals the sum of those two numbers, which is 1. But then we also update these values in 2, is set equal to what n1 is, which actually means we change this non-local version, and then n1 equals n, which doesn't change it in this case. And at the end, we return n, and because this function is returning, we eliminate that local variable, and we've gotten to the next value in the sequence, but we've updated the state of these two local variables. If we call fibfunc again, then we once again refer to these non-local variable values. And this time, inside of fib, n will equal the sum of those two things. And n2 will be updated to be n1, so it doesn't change. But then n1 is updated to be n, 
and we'll return that value. And then when this returns, we have moved forward in the sequence again. So you can see how repeated calls to this nested subprogram, this closure, keep giving us sequential values in the Fibonacci sequence. But what if we call fibgen again? Now I have a second variable, fibfunc2, and I'm going to call that as a function and see what it produces. So we can see that after printing several values in the Fibonacci sequence using fibfunc, we then print the first two values using fibfunc2, and we have indeed reset the sequence. Or more accurately, we started a new copy of the sequence because I can go back to calling the original fibfunc and we'll see that we actually get the next value that we had in our first sequence of output. So the reason that we can go back and forth between these sequences is that every time I call fibgen, I'm actually creating a new closure that maintains its state. So if I call fibfunc, it'll update the values of n1 and n2 inside of that particular closure. But if I call fibfunc2, it's updating n1 and n2 within a different closure that was generated with the same function. But the variables are distinct. Common Lisp features closures as well. What you do is you use a let construct to define the variables that will be part of the state. And then you define a function or functions inside of that let scope. And then you can call those functions. So in this example over here, we have let in one and in two equals zero. And then we define fib similarly to how we did in the Python example. And then after that, we call that function 20 times, which produces this result. And now I'm gonna add an additional function inside my closure named reset that resets the values of the variables n1 and n2. So if I call reset at the bottom of this code and then print out calls to fib again, it has now reset the sequence. Notice that after printing out several Fibonacci numbers, we then get 1, 1 because we've reset the sequence. I'll end this video by pointing out that although closures are interesting, they're not really doing anything that you couldn't do in a different way using objects. So on the left, I have some Java code. And here, I'm simply instantiating an object that contains some local state and then calling a method repeatedly to get the result I want. Notice that running this code produces the same sequence of Fibonacci numbers as we had in the previous two examples. So in this example, the main function defines a variable, a class variable fib, that points to a newly constructed instance of this class, not closure fib. And this class contains two private instance variables, n1 and n2. They are initialized to zero, and then this class is referred to by that variable in the main method, main function. So as I repeatedly call the fib method, which belongs to this variable, which is also named fib, it will update the internal state of these private instance variables and then return a result. And so the first call updates n1 to be 1, n2 is still 0. The next call will leave us with a 1 and a 1. And then we'll have a 2 and a 1. And so on, which is how we go through the sequence. So closures, objects, 
use whichever you like or whichever is available in whatever language you're using. Uh, just be aware that there are a variety of ways to maintain state between calls of a function or a method that can be used to suit your needs.